It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to the Locked On Podcast Network Mock Draft Day 4. Today, picks 19 with Atlanta, 20 with Minnesota, 21 with Utah, 22 with Chicago, and 23 with Indiana, 24 with Portland to wrap it up. And then tomorrow's edition, the final six picks of the first round of the NBA Draft. Jeremy Wu will be back with us from Sports Illustrated, giving us the breakdown of each player selected and what he expects out of them. Locked on NBA host Josh Lloyd every Monday with the biggest names on the local, excuse me, the lo- biggest local names on the biggest stories will join us along with Jake Madison to give his analysis of what's taking place every three picks. So that's all coming up today. Remember, the Locked On Podcast Network has an individual daily podcast for you on your favorite NBA and NFL team. So make sure you subscribe. And there's incredible draft coverage being put out all across the network right now. So make sure you go to LockedOnSports.com for the latest and click on the tab. You can get the episodes one, two, and three all on your Locked On NBA feed. But let's get Episode 4, underway. It's the Locked On Podcast Network Mock Draft. We start with pick number 19, the Atlanta Hawks, who earlier today picked Jaron Jackson with the third pick and will be on the board again with the 30th. Here's the 19th pick of the NBA Draft. We move over to Brad Rowland in the Atlanta Hawks Draft War Room. This is Brad Rowland, the host of the Locked On Hawks podcast, representing the Atlanta Hawks and the number 19 Overall pick uh, after going with Jaron Jackson Jr. at number three overall, uh, a very dis- very diff- difficult decision there, but definitely happy with the way that that pick turned out. A lot has transpired, of course, since number since number three overall. There's a ton of uh, upheaval from the sort of consensus in this class, and that is definitely to be expected when it comes to evaluating the NBA draft, where things almost always seem to go sideways somewhere along the way, and that is the case here as the Hawks are evaluating a number of different prospects at number 19 overall. Uh, candidly, most of our top 18, 19 guys in this class are off the board, so that makes the decision not quite as easy. No, no free-falling guy that we had in the top 10 or so in this class, but a number of prospects to be evaluating, and uh, as sort of as the backdrop, Jaron Jackson Jr. being being the investment at number three overall takes uh, a little bit into account when it comes to uh, potentially avoiding big men at this slot because of the fact that now arguably the, the two best assets on the Hawks roster are you know at least tangential centers, probably primary centers, but at least guys who uh, can certainly feature there in Jackson Jr. and John Collins. Um, with that said, a lot of different uh, trade possibilities and sort of things to kick around here. The Hawks also have picks at number 19, 30, and 34 overall in this class. So there was a little bit of uh, at least potential to maneuver, to maneuver and potentially move up in this class, but nothing uh, struck our fancy enough in order to pull the trigger on a deal like that and uh, wanted to avoid over, overpaying for uh, a tier of players that are basically all kind of bunched together here. There were a couple of guys that they had slid a pick or a pick or two further down, there could have been a potential trade scenario, and I would have been more willing to sort of sell the farm in a lot of ways. But at number 19, a soft landing spot for a number of different prospects here. Uh, guys that are in consideration for us. A couple of point guards, Aaron Holiday potentially out of UCLA, also Jalen Brunson out of Villanova. The Hawks uh, can certainly use uh, an infusion of talent at the point guard spot. Uh, Zan and Musa of uh, Senevita uh, as a scoring first kind of guy. Also Elliot Kobo, another point guard kind of option. Mitchell Robinson, a center that wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be a cross off because he is so athletic and so versatile and uh, definitely a lottery kind of pedigree as well as Josh Okogie out of Georgia Tech. A couple of just different names kick around there. Also Melvin Frazier, a tangential consideration out of Tulane as a 3 and D player. And finally, DeAnthony Melton, a combo guard type out of USC who probably fell too far in this class so far as a, as a result of not playing a ton last season, really not playing at all last season at, U, at USC after some FBI investigations. Uh, in the end, though, we are definitely sort of looking at different players that are uh, as part of the same tier, but uh, we, we're going to go with USC's DeAnthony Melton at number 19 overall. This could be considered at least a slight reach in terms of some of the consensus mocks, but this is a guy who is in a, a top 20 prospect on our board and fits beautifully with the uh, 
with the move to take Jaron Jackson at number three overall. Uh, the Hawks are crafting a defense first approach under, uh, under the direction of first year head coach Lloyd Pearson with Jackson being a defense first prospect. Melton is a potentially devastating defender who also has a lot of ball creation skills. Probably would have been a lottery type of pick had he played at USC this season. A lot of jump shots, uh, you know, creation, um, improvement there on the, on the horizon for Melton. Uh, ultimately he could certainly be a guy who is a lead guard type. Um, probably not necessarily, uh, off the charts upside offensively. When you talk about his 6'8 wingspan and his defensive mindset and the fact that he could certainly eat up opposing uh, offensive players while also running an offense and initiating offense for himself and others, a tantalizing uh, kind of prospect there for, with the Anthony Melton from USC. So the, uh, the Hawks will be going in that direction. They still have two more picks in the top 34, but at this juncture, a defense first, uh, fundamentally sound, very, very impressive draft to this point. And in our opinion, of course, with Jaron Jackson Jr. and DeAnthony Melton, and we'll move on with an eye toward the final pick in the first round at number 30 later on in the mock draft. Melton's a really interesting pick for the Hawks, and I'm not sure I agree with Brad that it's necessarily a huge reach at 16. For this reason, we don't know what he would have been this year because he didn't play for USC, and sure, he couldn't shoot great his freshman year, but for all you know, he spent the entire year shooting and has improved that. You're now relying on draft workouts and what you've seen in person, and there are two or three skills on his game that if he were to improve them a little bit, he becomes a really interesting prospect. So I'm not sure, excuse me, at 19, that I think that that is the hugest reach there by Atlanta, as Brad said. In fact, I think it's just a really good pick. You didn't ask my opinion, but I thought I'd share that. Let's find out what the expert, Jeremy Wu of Sports Illustrated, thinks of the pick. Melton is a really, you know, tough player, defensive minded. I think has a lot going for him right now. Uh, you know, despite sitting out the season at USC, you know, getting sort of uh, screwed over a little bit. I think that he, um, you know, covers a lot of ground. He's good at making opposing ball handlers uncomfortable. Uh, he was good at the combine, and I, I think teams have, you know, been. I think some of their concerns have been assuaged by their interviews with him. Um, you know, his jump shot does not look broken. I think he'll be able to hit an open shot. Uh, but when you're looking at him, you're looking at him as an off-ball player. You know, he's not a true point guard, uh, despite being about 6'2". So if you're taking Melton, I think you need to pair him with an offensive-minded guard to sort of maximize those lineups. But uh, he definitely is a good prospect. I think he's first-round worthy. And I think if he had played the whole year at USC, uh, it might be a more clear case. Who would be hard to find that six foot two off-guard player? Who comes to your mind? Is he a Patrick Beverly defensive type player without the point guard skills? I'm not sure Beverly had the point guard skills when he came out of college. Yeah, no, I think that's actually that, that's sort of what I was looking for. I think that you know that's the natural comparison when we talk about defensive minded guards uh, who are playing off the ball. I think that's the type of role you could see him in. Uh, you know, if you look at you know what they were able to do with him when he was in Houston and sort of let Harden create, sort of park him off the ball, and he does other stuff. I think that's fine. You know, Melton will be able to handle whatever the tougher defensive assignment is in the backcourt. You know, he's long. He'll be able to guard bigger guards. Uh, and he's kind of a pest. So I think there's a lot to like. And when you have three first-round draft picks, you can take a little bit of a gamble. All right, let me reset where we are as we move to the 20th pick. The Minnesota Timberwolves are now on the clock. The top of the draft got moved around a little bit as Luka Doncic went number one in the draft. DeAndre Ayton went two, Jaron Jackson three, Trey Young four, Mo Bamba five, Wendell Carter Jr. six, Marvin Bagley seven. Though Mikel Bridges eight and Michael Porter Jr. nine, all projections seem to have probably eight of those guys, maybe Bridges is nine, all going in that order. Then the surprise of the draft started with the Knicks getting Michael Porter at nine. It meant that the point guard started to slide. That's worth keeping an eye on on Thursday. And so we moved into the second tier of the draft here, even though Bridges kind of moved a notch forward. Kevin Knox went 10. Lonnie Walker went 11. Shea Gilgis Alexander, surprisingly, as a point guard, went ahead of Colin Sexton. Miles Bridges, Michigan State, 13. And then you move that. 13 seems to be pretty well set, maybe with Colin Sexton 
uh, in that as the top 14. Zaire, now we moved into the next tier of this draft. Zaire Smith, Robert Williams. You're reaching a little bit on all of these guys. Tony, uh, Troy Brown at 16. Kevin Herter at 17. Colin Sexton at 18. And just a moment ago, DeAnthony Melton at 19. So who is your flavor of choice? What is the individual skill that each of these guys have that you really, really like? That's what's driving picks now because none of these guys are clearly set in who they are and how they necessarily fit into the NBA. So let's go. Minnesota is ready. Let's head into their draft headquarters with Colton Maletsi. It was an exciting year for the Timberwolves. Started out with Jimmy Butler joining the team on draft day, following a trade with the Chicago Bulls that sent Zach Levine and Chris Dunn and their pick, swapping picks to get the 17th pick, and Jimmy Butler in Minnesota to pair him with Andrew Wiggins, who later on that summer signed a max contract, and Carl Anthony Towns, a team that led the Timberwolves to their first playoff berth in 13 seasons after a somewhat disappointing end to the season by getting the gentleman sweep from the Houston Rockets and only managing one game and some confusing performances from the starters on the Timberwolves in that playoff series. Now the Timberwolves are staring down the gun of the 20th pick in the NBA draft. Some needs for the Timberwolves, obviously, being the worst team shooting and making the three-point shot, as well as one of the worst teams in three-point percentage, along with one of the worst perimeter defenses in the NBA. Clearly, perimeter defense and offense, top priorities, especially with their top three-point shooter, Jamal Crawford, leaving the Timberwolves as of this summer. Also, power forward depth a big need that the Timberwolves should look to as well very shallow at the power forward spot dream scenario for the team obviously grabbing somebody like a McCall Bridges or even a Kevin Knox somebody who's really going to shore up the perimeter you know he's going to be able to play with the stars as both a three-point shooter and score and somebody if you get like a Kevin Knox who could defend the three-point shot very well but that's the dream scenario obviously that is far-fetched at best big decisions at this point are guys like uh D'Anthony Melton guys like uh Chimizzi Matu the power forward that you maybe could go for Chandler Hutchinson out of Boise State you have guys like Aaron Holiday maybe he's somebody who is the maybe not the position you're going for right away but he does have the talents you're looking for he is probably the most talented p- player at the the 20th pick do you pick between him do you go with Matu somebody who would shore up a position that's shallow or do you go with a Chandler Hutchinson just a wing guy who could hopefully mold into the spot you need him to fit exactly those are some of the decisions facing the Timberwolves at this 20th pick some of the guys that they are looking at at this 20th pick as far as trade possibilities uh, bouncing around between the the other uh, GMs, I know that uh, the Locked On Lakers podcast offered up uh, a p- their pick at twenty five. Maybe able to loosen up some cap space. Anybody who's able to loosen some cap space for them for that pick, obviously cap space is, is tight for the Timberwolves, so that makes it hard for them to move around pieces for draft picks because of the contracts that they're looking to get rid of maybe aren't the ones that most teams are looking to grab so they're pretty much locked in at that 20th pick and it's going to be hard for them to really bump up significantly enough to grab a guy in that dream scenario like a Kevin Knox so one of those guys to really make it worth worth it for them probably you're giving it more than is worth uh, an un tested raw talent coming out of college so as far as trade possibilities for this team looks like they're going to stay locked down at that 20th spot and now the question that could make or break the bench for the Timberwolves maybe even decide some games down the stretch of this season who are the Timberwolves taking for the 20th pick in the 2018 NBA draft the Timberwolves are taking Aaron Holiday point guard out of UCLA why they're why they're taking a point guard when they have guys like Derrick Rose they could come they could bring him back they have Jeff T already under that big contract Tyus Jones a young guy that they've liked Aaron Brooks 
a point guard that they brought on last summer to kind of bring depth to the position. Why bring in Aaron Holiday? Well, there are a few reasons. First of all, Aaron Holiday is a fantastic three-point shooter. Fantastic three-point shooter. He's definitely giving you a lot of offense from the perimeter, and he's going to be able to create a lot of that offense for himself. He is very good off the dribble, really good in those man-to-man defenses. He's going to be able to take on a defender head-on, and he's going to be able to make shots, knock down shots in his face. Speaking of knocking down shots, he hit 42% of his three-point shots last season for UCLA, attempting 6.2 6.2 three-pointers per game. So not only can take them in volume, he can also knock them down in volume. And maybe most importantly, it's important not to let the Timberwolves get into this mindset of, oh, they need to pick this certain position. Oh, they need to make sure they fill this certain position. Aaron Holiday is the best player available at the 20th pick. You've got to grab talent and then make sure that you can help mold that talent into your roster. Great talent is going to find a way to make plays on your roster and when you're picking the best talent available at that pick that is the best decision automatically Aaron Holiday Aaron Holiday the best player at the 20th pick so that's the decision the Timberwolves need to make finally some added depth Aaron Holiday is going to fill a lot of holes for the Timberwolves just with what he's able to do three-point shooting wise and offensively what he's able to give that second unit and able to bring to the starting unit bringing in a point guard freeze up some things for the Timberwolves. Now maybe Tyus Jones, you're able to move him with one of those big contracts contracts I mentioned earlier, maybe able to loosen up some cap space, head into the free agency, able to make some moves because now you have a really good point guard on a rookie contract and you're able to give away another young talented player like Ty- Tyus Jones who is on a really good contract able to package him with maybe a Gorgie and to get rid of some of that deadly cap situation that the Timberwolves find themselves in headed into this summer so there's a lot of reasons to take Aaron Holiday the three-point shooting best available player at the pick at number 20 and maybe could potentially help the Timberwolves cap situation down the road so Aaron Holiday point guard out of UCLA that is the 20th pick for the Minnesota Timberwolves Another holiday in the NBA. That'll make three of them. He is the brother of Drew and Justin, a super smart player, understands the game well. As Colton mentioned, shot it brilliantly at UCLA, and the idea of possibly moving Tyus Jones is worthwhile. Minnesota's got to get out from under some of these numbers. Holiday's short with a great reach, but the sh- he is really small, and that would be a concern. But Tyus Jones has been that small and been successful for Minnesota. Let's hear what Jeremy Wu, Sports Illustrated, has to say with his player breakdown of the 20th pick, Locked On Podcast Network mock draft, Aaron Holiday. Holiday has a lot of fans in the NBA. I think it obviously helps that, you know, both of his brothers, Drew and Justin, have been successful pros. Uh, you know, when teams are doing background, you know, you look at the family, you look at you know, the kid, who is he as a person? And I think that's a pretty good precedent. Uh, he's a guy who will be a very good, I think will safely be a good guy to lead your second unit. I don't know that he becomes a starting point guard. He's not a great defender. He will fight defensively, but the size, I think, will limit him. Uh, but if you're looking for a guy who's going to be, you know, a good rotation player, uh, who will be able to, you know, initiate offense, will score some uh, off the bench as a spark, I think he's a good candidate for that. You know, he really stepped up this year at UCLA with Lonzo Ball gone. Uh, he proved he can run the offense, he can score. Um, and, uh, you know, he's long, which I think helps compensate for his lack of, of height. Well, thanks, Jeremy. Hey, um, I, I'm a bit frazzled. I'm on the clock right now. I, I'm also the GM of the Utah Jazz. So give me a quick second, and I'll come back with my pick. So the Utah Jazz entered the 2018 NBA draft with lots of different options. Over the last few years, they've had grand success drafting Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell in the draft. They also had big success by trading a pick to Atlanta through Indiana and getting George Hill. So the first decision the Jazz have to make is, are they trying to find a veteran that can fill a gap on their current roster to complement Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert and Joe Ingles, their primary pieces, 
and it also might prepare them in case Derek Favors or Dante Exum leaves in the offseason. The biggest need the Jazz have is probably more versatility at the four, and I think they need to try to figure out what is the ultimate example of the third guard to play with Ricky Rubio and Donovan Mitchell. If you look at the Jazz moving forward, the core is Rudy Gobert and the core is Donovan Mitchell, so you're looking for players that complement them. And that's the dream scenario here, is that the Jazz could find another one of these gems in the draft who's ready to make a really large impact. But in all likelihood, at 21, that is not going to happen. There are some nice players on this board, and you're probably trying to find someone who can plug in right now. But at 21, that is not something that I looked at and felt that the Jazz had a huge possibility of being able to accomplish on this draft night. It's why uh, early on in the draft process, I tried to make a deal with Charlotte to move the Utah Jazz to 11th, was willing to take Marvin Williams' contract, who Marvin would have served us nicely as a stretch four. We knew culturally he's the right guy, having been in Utah before. He's actually a pretty good post-up player. But despite the fact that we were willing to eat you know, twelve, fourteen million dollars worth of contract. Charlotte would not move down ten spots in the draft. Uh, to me, that actually felt like a pretty good offer to Charlotte. If you kind of watch the NBA, usually if someone's taking twelve or fourteen million dollars off of someone's cap, they're getting a first round pick. I was just getting ten slots better, and they were still getting this twenty first pick, but they turned it down and uh, obviously ended up making their pick for Lonnie Walker at the 11th spot on the draft. Mitch Kupchak slash uh, Walter Meal and Doug uh, Branson didn't want to make that uh, trade. Uh, that was really the only trade possibility we looked at. There was some talk with Toronto about maybe trading this 21st pick for DeLon Wright, which I think is a worthwhile, but Wright's contract comes up a little bit faster, and you'd have to really decide you think Wright's that much better than what you could get at this 21 pick, but that was a that was a legitimate possibility for the Jazz, uh, at least in my conversations. Um, I obviously talked to Denver because everything that the Jazz have ever done with Denver's worked beautifully, uh, but we weren't really interested in taking the Kenneth Fareed deal uh, and trying to move up in that spot up there on the draft. If we'd moved up, uh, the thought was maybe to go uh, try to go grab uh, Shea Gilgus Alexander with that 11th pick. Uh, Bridge, uh, Miles Bridges would have been another possibility if we could have moved up the draft. Uh, and that would have been really, in my mind, Shea Gilgus Alexander at six foot six, and the possibility of hitting a little bit and being a, a significant piece was the player that I would have moved up to try to go get in that circumstance. Uh, but we didn't. So instead, we're sitting here now at 21 in the draft, unable to make a move, and we're going to pick, uh, make the pick. The first decision, I think, is are we trying to find a player that's ready right now? And if that is the decision, so then I think there's some really interesting possibilities. There's uh, Grayson Allen, who's clearly set with his four years. you got to figure out what all the tripping and all that was about. Uh, there's Dante DiVincenzo, who's had his three years. He's ready. So either of those two guard spots. DiVincenzo is at six foot three, seems six foot four, six foot five, and, and, and Grayson Allen, that same height. Both are elite, elite athletes. M- didn't hit on a bunch of their shots. Uh, but are elite athletes and probably could complement Donovan uh, very well, being both a ball handler, allowing him to play off the ball and playing with him. So those two uh, were very interesting possibilities, and that was the decision I was making there. Uh, Ellie Okobo is a nice player, but I think those two are probably more advanced than him. I really like Melvin Frazier a great deal on the wing. His shot's a little funky when he gets around the basket. He's got a high release that you're going to have to figure out if it can really last in the NBA, uh, but I really like Melvin Frazier as a small forward. I think the minute he steps on the floor in an NBA game, he'll be athletically uh, matched to anyone who's out there and should be all right. Uh, so if I was going to kind of go for that wing positionally, I probably would have gone there. Um, I'm also a fan of the kid out of Boston College, uh, Jerome Robinson. He's... Um, a bona fide scorer might have that special, special ability uh, to jump into this. Um, Shamit, by the way, is probably another one that's worth talking about a little bit, uh, though I probably would have had Grayson Allen and DiVincenzo ahead of him. Uh, so the small forward, if I was going there, we've got Jerome Robinson, Melvin Frazier. Really and the big I liked uh, is uh, Mo Wagner, the six foot ten, 263-pound uh, Michigan 
stretch. The concern there, four assists his rookie year in 258 minutes, 20 his sophomore year, and only 33. If I believed he could be Kelly Olenek, that's my pick. But I'm not sure I believe that. And I'm not sure I'm sold necessarily on any of these guys. So considering I wasn't certain, and Grayson Allen is probably the one who uh, I, I'm, I'm most close to pulling the trigger on, but I decided to, to take a flyer. Uh, Zana Musa out of Croatia is 19 years old. He's a bona fide scorer. He's got a great uh, go and catch game. He's very creative around the rim. He's going to get physically stronger. His catch and shoot game needs a lot of work, but that should help when he gets physically stronger. Defensively is going to be an issue for him, but I, I just... He's been a main guy at 19 years old in the Croatian League playing with adults. And I think he's a year or two away. He wants to come back now. But that's our pick is Zana Musa. I feel as though that's the – with with Herter off the board, I kind of like D'Anthony Melton, but it doesn't really match. I, I, I'm just not sure that anyone we're getting at 21 is a piece that pushes the Jazz a great deal forward next year. And so maybe Moose is a piece that pick, pushes them forward in two or three years as he develops. And his developmental upside, I thought, was bigger than anyone else's that I saw here. So Zana Musa is the pick at the 21st pick of the Locked On Podcast Network mock draft. Now let's see what Jeremy Wu of Sports Illustrated thinks of Musa. Musa is an interesting prospect because he's not a traditional European wing where he's spotting up on, on the wing and... You know, shooting threes and not playing defense. You know, he he's a guy who's really aggressive and he's known for playing really hard. And I think that's one of the things he has going for him. Uh, he can really put the ball in the basket. You know, he can shoot a three. He'll attack the rim. You know, I, obviously there's concerns about athletically how that translates to the NBA. Uh, defensively, I don't think he's going to give you much. Uh, I'm a little skeptical about what his actual NBA fit is long term. Uh, but there's talent there, and he's put up big numbers. Uh, I think teams will be interested in, in, in him in this range of the draft. Um, the other thing with him is I think there are some personality concerns in terms of his maturity. Uh, how does he view himself as a player? Uh, because the reality of it is, you know, he will probably have to be a role player in the NBA. Uh, and, you know, he might view himself as more than that just based on, you know, what he's been able to do so far coming up. Uh, so there's reason for concern, I think, with him. Uh, and he wants to come over to the NBA right now, which I think might make it a little bit harder for him uh, in terms of, you know, getting drafted uh, highly. But I, I would expect him to end up in the late first round, uh, early second at worst. And I think the talent is clearly there that it's worth a try. Can he handle as a pick-and-roll wing? Yeah, that's a big question. Um, you know, as a playmaker, I don't know how great he is as a passer. Uh, you know, he's more of a shoot-first guy, so I think you wonder – you know, if you do put him in those situations, will he, will he want to facilitate offense? Uh, will he be able to do it? I think that's a fair reason for concern. And if you look at the, the type of wings who are they're having success in the NBA, too, it's usually the guys who are a little bit multifaceted who become you know stars within their role, guys who will be able to you know hit a shot or make a pass. Uh, and I don't know if he's that. So is Zana Musa going 21? We're three picks in the to today's episode with DeAnthony Melton going 19, Aaron Holiday 20 to Minnesota, Zana Musa, 21 to Utah. Chicago is now on the clock for the second time today. Earlier, they got Marvin Bagley with the seventh pick. But first, let's head over to Josh Lloyd, the host of Monday's Locked on NBA, the biggest, the local experts on the biggest stories, and Jake Madison, host of the Wednesday edition with John Corrales. Thanks, David. Uh, another few picks here to look at. Another team with their second selection in the first round of the draft, and that's the Atlanta Hawks selecting D'Anthony Melton out of USC, and then Minnesota getting another uh, Southern California, another Los Angeles uh, college-based guard in Aaron Holiday. Jake, what would you make of these two uh, guards going back-to-back at 19 and 20? Yeah, I would have flipped these. You know, I, I think Atlanta should have gone with Aaron Holiday here. You know, you don't know what's going on with Dennis Schrader there, and I think that's why I might have taken him there. You know, it, it gives you a little bit more for what you need. He can grow. He needs a little bit of work. Their timeline there is a little bit better for that in Atlanta. I would have thrown Melton to Minnesota, which – feels entirely like a Tom Thibodeau pick where he's strong defensively. He doesn't create his own offense and kind of needs someone else to get him the ball. And you don't need a shot creator there. So I would have flipped these two, but again, they both have high upside. You're kind of in this range where you take chances on guys. And if you fall in love with one, you fall in love with one. 
Yeah, look, I'm, I'm really interested to see what Melton can do, and it would have fit really well in Minnesota, but obviously they didn't even have the chance of getting him here with Atlanta going early. Um, I personally, I think I probably would have you know, looked at Melton ahead of Holiday if I was Atlanta, just for overall talent, even, even though the fit necessarily isn't quite there. But I can understand your, your reasonings with that. And then with the uh, the 21st pick, David Locke and the Utah Jazz have uh, have gone international with uh, Zanin Musa out of, uh, I think he's Bosnian, um, played in the Croatian League last season, a big wing, really strong scorer and shooter, six foot nine. But defense is uh, is a real issue. But when you're playing alongside Rudy Gobert, Joe Ingles, Ricky Rubio, doesn't really matter that much how bad your defense is. No, and I'll let you guys in on some behind-the-scenes secret here. David actually tried to trade this pick and some others to me with the Pelicans for Nikola Miritich. So he kind of gets the Miritich of the draft in this pick. And this is a guy who kind of had the ball in his hands a lot overseas, but he's a good shooter. If he can adjust to a different role and still has that consistency in his shot, this is a very good pick for him, particularly at 21. I've seen Musa be projected from you know, pick 14 through to about pick 35. So there's a massive range for him. I guess it all depends on your appetite for uh, defensive uh, ineptitude. But the offensive part of his game, which we know the Jazz have struggled with at times in terms of just having someone to get you know, get their own shot off. And Donovan Mitchell carried a huge load there. Adding a guy like Musa, who wouldn't be you know, necessarily even playing a big role this season, he might stay in Europe. I think it's a really strong selection for a team that does develop international players and scouts international players at a, at a really, really high level. All right, we'll give Josh and Jake another segment later since they didn't butcher me for my pick as the general manager of the Utah Jazz. Back as commissioner, leader, host of the Locked On podcast, Network mock draft. We have three picks left. Chicago, Indiana, and Portland. Reminder, Reddit AMA today at 2 o'clock Eastern. We have a Reddit AMA going for you at 2 o'clock Eastern every day of our mock draft with your questions about the draft, so be sure to join us. All right, the Chicago Bulls are back on the board. Let's go over to Jordan and Nick and see what's going on in Bulls headquarters. All right, thanks, David. Matt Peck and Jordan Maui along with you here again for the number 22 pick. In the draft, earlier on in the draft, if you were tuning in to the lottery, we took Marvin Bagley the third from Duke University with our number seven overall pick. Some interesting stuff going on there. Uh, kind of swings our decision here at number 22, and I think a stronghold at what we thought number 22 in discussing who the Bulls might take there, Matt, I think has become a little bit more evident now that we have Marvin Bagley in our bag. Yeah, definitely. I mean, whether it was the fact that we got lucky and Bagley slid to us at seven, or if the Bulls ended up taking somebody like Wendell Carter, with that seventh pick that absolutely means seeing as how we did take uh keep the 22nd pick and the bulls know that they need to add depth at that wing position specifically versatile players three and d players uh it was it was a clear-cut decision here as far as the biggest need for the team and it was just a matter of choosing between the wings that were available at 20 so we had a few conversations just briefly one being with the san antonio spurs about potentially moving up colin sexton went there at number 18 and we know how the front office of the bulls is very fascinated by both trey young and colin sexton so interesting the move there obviously things did not work out there but matt in a ideal scenario what are we looking for here at number 22 and with with what's available so far. I mean, in an ideal scenario at 22, you may have seen somebody valued in the teens falling, something similar to what happened to the Bulls a few years ago when Bobby Portis fell in their lap at 22. Nobody was expecting that to happen. Uh, some guys that maybe, I, I mean, you mentioned Colin Sexton. Uh, Kevin Herter is a guy who really rocketed up a lot of people's draft boards in late May and early June. I think the Bulls would certainly have loved to add a player like that. The Bucks took him at 17, so unfortunately he wasn't there on the board for the Bulls. Another guy that I had my eye on for the Bulls, Janan Musa. Uh, who's been playing the Croatian League, not so much a, a two-way player, definitely more of an offensive threat than a defensively capable player, uh, but that that decision was taken away from us as Utah selected him 21st right before the Bulls came on the clock. So ideal situation would have been somebody like maybe Sexton or maybe Herter from Maryland falling to us at 22, um, but still a, a nice pool to pick from here at this spot. Yeah, I agree, and I think it makes the decision a little bit, a little less difficult, I should say, in deciding whether or not the Bulls need to take a wing. And obviously at number seven, we talked about how that need is desperate here for the Bulls. And so we've got a choice between Chandler Hutchinson, 
who we've heard a lot about, and I think this pick is interesting to us too. A guy that in his senior season with Boise State scored 23.2 points per game, 8.9 rebounds, 4 assists, shot at a clip at nearly 39% from 3 while he didn't take that many 3s in the league. Uh, Chandler Hutchison... The development from Boise State from his freshman year to his senior season, I think, has intrigued a lot of Bulls fans. Absolutely. And we heard earlier in the combine process when Hutchison withdrew that maybe there was a promise on the table and that maybe the Bulls were the team that made that promise. Since then, we've heard it's more likely that Brooklyn made that promise down at 29. I think he's exactly the two-way player at the wing the Bulls are looking for. Six seven, good height, a seven one wingspan. Started to knock down the three ball more confidently in his junior and senior years. And is that of that mold that this Bulls front office tends to go with, which is a multiple year player, a four year player? Um, the other options on the table at this available spot, maybe Kata Bates Diop of Ohio State, although he projects to be a bit more like a power forward in the NBA than a, than a wing. Uh, and then Jacob Evans of Cincy, who has been kind of sliding down people's draft boards and doesn't quite have the athletic tools that Hutchison has and doesn't necessarily maybe have the same, uh, the, the same defensive versatility that Hutchison has. So that's kind of what, what we were sitting at here, uh, at pick 22. And I think you and I, without too much trouble, came to the consensus that Hutchison was the guy. Yeah, and to just a quick note for everybody else around the league, obviously Chandler Hutchison shut down his workouts even before any individual workouts with any team during the NBA Combine early on in May. It was rumored that he was given a guarantee at number 22 or between number 17 and number 22 or 23. A lot of teams talked about the Bulls having that connection there. Obviously, Mark Bartlestein of Priority Sports is Chandler Hutchinson's agent, longtime friend of Jerry Reinsdorf and their family connections, and you know how deep-rooted that is for the Bulls, as well as talking about uh, just some of the intangibles. And it makes sense here that Chandler Hutchinson would be the guy, even though that it might steer Bulls fans a little bit the wrong way because of some of those missteps and uh, some of those connections that the Bulls have um, doing deals with agents and stuff. And I don't know if that's coming to fruition or not, but looking at the player that Chandler Hutchison is in, keeping in mind that we took Marvin Bagley at number seven, I think it makes all the sense in the world. And I just look at his, his usage and his game overall, his true shooting percentage, which is something that I think sparked me as far as looking at the forward position, he compared nicely to Paul George and what his shooting his true shooting percentage was this season. He compared nicely to other guys in the league like Giannis Antetokounmpo, which true shooting percentage also includes three point percentage and gives you a little bit of an incentive there. So I like everything about Chandler Hutchinson, and I think his work ethic and his leadership can definitely be a positive going into this locker room next season. Yeah, I think a couple more pluses that had me giving him an edge over Evans and Bates Diop. Uh, over Evans, I think Hutchinson. I mean, you talk about his his true shooting. Percentage percentage and his uh, talent as a shooter he can also create his own shot off the dribble uh, and he can do that I think more effectively than Evans can at this point point. and he also has a pretty high motor and that is the one knock on Bates Diop right now and uh, why some people believe that he might fall uh, into the late latter stages of this first round because people question his motor so I think all of those reasons combined of that trio that we were picking from there at 22 Hutchinson edges out Evans and base the op for various reasons. Yeah, I think the only weakness for Chandler Hutchinson as we kind of wrap this up is he's a little bit undersized for a guy that plays the combo guard uh, wing position, but I have no doubt that coming into the league in the first couple of years, he'd be able to bulk himself up. I don't. I think he's a guy that you can plug and play right away, and we'll be able to see, especially on that second unit where they're going to need desperate help at the wing position this year. So at the number 22 pick, the Bulls select Chandler Hutchison out of Boise State. Thanks for listening to us here at Locked on Bulls. You can follow us on Twitter at Locked on Bulls, at Jordan C. Malley, and at Bulls underscore Peck. David, back to you. Well, thanks, guys. And the Chandler Hutchinson story has been an interesting one, taken off the workout train, and the Bulls scoop him up with the 22nd pick. Let's go to Jeremy Wu of Sports Illustrated to get his breakdown on Hutchinson. Hutchinson is a guy who really broke out this year statistically, um, you know, really carried that Boise State team. I have a lot of, I think, fans in sort of in that late first round area, I think, which is where he'll go. And I just talked to the Bulls of a team that gave him a promise, but uh, I think the hope is that he'll be ready to sort of step onto the court early in his career uh, and give you something. Uh, you know, he can shoot, he can rebound. 
He can play off the ball, which is something that I think is a little bit overlooked. But you know, as a junior or as a junior before this season, you know, he his numbers and he was playing more in a role that was, you know, making cuts. I think he can do that. So I think if you're a team that you know wants a guy who can sort of fit in in a number of different lineups, I think he's a good candidate to be able to do that. So we have two more picks left today: the Indiana Pacers and the Portland Trailblazers. And they're both coming up next on the Locked On Podcast Network NBA Mock Draft. The Locked On Podcast Network covers every NBA and NFL team, plus a growing list of Major League Baseball teams. So when a big story breaks and you want the local experts, you go to the Locked On Podcast Network. Where? At LockedOnSports.com. Bookmark LockedOnSports.com. It's the home for your local experts on all the biggest stories. LockedOnSports.com. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. The Pacers were one of the great stories of the league last year, recovering from Paul George departing and Victor Oladipo's big season. So let's go into the Indiana Pacers draft headquarters and find out what they're looking at with the 23rd pick of the NBA draft. Welcome into the Pacer Draft Room. Here with you guys is the Locked On Pacers Guide. My name is Adam Friedman. And joining me on the other line is Tony East. I think we're in agreement right now that the Pacers' two biggest needs are guard or forward and mainly depth. Right, Tony? Yeah, I think it, you could uh, you could say that you know that maybe they need like another like another big if Al Jefferson's going to go, but that would be like the very longest game ever and would make absolutely no sense in this scenario given that it's a first round pick. So I would agree with you that. A wing or a, or a depth guard is the move here. So the Pacers picked 23rd overall. The pick right before them was a guy I think we both liked, Chandler Hutchinson. But yes, he that went, was sad. That was a bummer. And another guard we liked, or a guard we liked, was Colin Sexton went number 18. So neither of those guys are available. So who's your best available guard? My best available guard is a toss-up between Shake Milton and Dante DiVincenzo, uh, two guys we already worked out. Um, Shake Milton's a little bit better let me phrase that. Shake Milton is definitely the better defender uh, out of SMU. Uh, he went for three years. They both went for three years. Or no, even yes, DiVincenzo was redshirted. They both went for three years. Uh, Milton's a little smaller, but he's a little better defender. DiVincenzo can shoot a little more, probably has a little more shot off the bounce. So it depends if you're looking more offense or defense. But given that Victor Oladipo is who he is, I think you would favor defense a little bit. And that's why I like Shake Milton quite a bit if we go guard. But DiVincenzo is a solid pick, too. So DiVincenzo is the se- so like, kind of sexy pick right now. I'm surprised he hasn't gone, actually, to be honest. <laughs> Me too. I thought for sure in this draft he would end up going probably, I was thinking it's maybe as high, high. as 15, yeah. 15, 18 range, but obviously did not go there. Uh, when it comes to forwards, who are the forwards I think we should be looking at? Uh, there's quite a few here. Uh, not quite a few, maybe two or three here. Uh, Jacob Evans from Cincinnati, uh, not the best shooter ever, but uh, lockdown defender kind of guy. Um K. Bates Diop from Ohio State, who I really like, shot 36% from three in college, another lockdown defender, uh, Big Ten Player of the Year. And if you want to even push a little bit, you could say Melvin Frazier, that dude from Tulane, another lockdown defender, but he has little offensive game and is pretty raw on the end of the court for his age. So then if we were to eliminate this down to the best guard and the best for me, the pick between them, we're probably picking between DiVincenzo and Bates Diop, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would probably throw myself in as a Milton guy. Um, you know, the, the, you, you get yourself in these Tyrus Thomas situations when you pick these dudes that fly up the draft board uh, so close to the draft, like with DiVincenzo. And sometimes it works out. Like last year, it kind of happened with Luke Kennard. And, you know, he got picked one pick before Donovan Mitchell. And he's a good player. The Pistons will be happy to have him, but they would much rather have Donovan Mitchell. Um, so you got to be careful with that kind of thing. But I do like DiVincenzo. But I think, you know, the Pacers, if they like the combo we guard kind of pick, uh, Shake Milton shows more promise there. But you can go either way. Fun fact in this uh – the locked on NBA draft last year to Luke Kennard at 18. We did get Luke Kennard at 18. I do remember that. So that, that's a fun fact from that. Um, <laughs> so I think I favor the Pacers need at forward just because they, they have one guard, well, two guards basically on the roster if they bring back Darren Collison, and they're a little bit weak in forward depth with basically just Bojan and then maybe Glenn Robinson depending on his health. So I think I favor going with a forward here. I don't know what, I don't know what you're thinking, though. I do too. You know, if you throw in Lance, is probably a guard. Um, yeah, I was kind of Lance as a guard. Yeah, then you probably have three, four guards going to be back next year, depending on what they think of Joe Young. It's easier for them to get more guards too than it is wings. Wings are, you know, the premier thing this year versus at the wing, you know, Bojan and, like you said, maybe GR3. But 
um, it's, it's a harder position to get a guy in, and it's harder to get that rotation looking good and useful. So uh, I think wing makes more sense, and I think it's pretty much who you like more between you know the the Bates Diop and uh, the Bates Diop Jacob Evans Frazier Frazier tier of guys there. And I think I like Bates Diop the best. Pitch brought him in for a workout on Monday, right? No, Friday. He was Friday the eighth. Uh, yes, the eighth. Um, yep. And he also is a four-year player at Ohio State. He's got a. Yep. He's just. He can probably come in and give you immediate help at some sense for a team that wants a guy who contribute probably midway through the first season versus the rookie that last year and TJ Leaf. So I think with the 23rd pick, we should take Bates D up. Sound good? Yeah, I'm going to rule out Frazier very easily off the top. Uh, no, not enough offensive skills to be meriting uh, picking here. Uh, and with Evans, you get a little more balance, but the shot was just not there for him at all. So I like the Big Ten player of the year. I think we should pick Keita Bates D up at 23. All right. So with the 23rd pick in the NBA draft, with a locked on NBA draft, Patients are going to select Keita Betts Dia. Well, we got a full inside scoop of all their decision making, some interesting names. I mean, this is what the essence of this draft is is that starting probably at about 19 to 40, it's whatever. It's not quite 31 flavors at Baskin and Robbins in the sense you're just taking whatever flavor you like, but it's awfully close. I mean, Mo Wagner very easily could go right now and very easily could go 40. Uh, Bates Jop is uh, Diop is probably a guy that goes right in here, but some of those other names that they mentioned in Shake Milton at SMU very well may go thirty-seven. So this is a little bit like going to the ice cream store. They're all ice cream, which means they're all pretty good. It just depends what flavor fits you at that moment. The flavor they chose is the kid out of Ohio State, and Jeremy Wu gives us the breakdown. Yeah, Kato K- Bates Diop is a guy who. Some teams are split on. Uh, some view as a late first round type. Uh, some think he's a second rounder. Uh, he clearly can score. Big Ten Player of the Year had a very good season uh, for Ohio State, and he's really the focal point of their offense. Uh, you know, he can shoot it. Uh, he's got length. You know, he rebounded pretty well. I think that's where my concerns stem from is that you know they were feeding him so many favorable touches uh, in sort of positions where he had a mismatch in the mid post. And if you're an NBA team, I don't think you're going to be running those types of plays for him. So for him to succeed in the NBA, I think he has to be able to shoot the ball well enough from three that he can stay on the floor because he's a great athlete. Uh, he's not explosive. I don't know how, how much his rebounding will translate, and I don't know how able he is to sort of bang on the interior as a power forward. He's probably going to have to be a small ball four. Um, so he has some theoretical versatility, uh, but I think there's reason to be skeptical of you know how he fits into the modern NBA. It's a perfect example of the flavor that you choose when you walk in. Baskin Robbins is an old reference. I probably should be doing something hip like salt and straw with all their crazy flavors as we have the modern ice cream and the modern NBA. It's our final pick of the mock draft for this Monday edition. Tomorrow, the Lakers, the 76ers, the Celtics, the Warriors, the Nets, and the Hawks. Huge franchises all the docket. A Reddit AMA today at 2 o'clock Eastern. And our final pick is the Portland Trailblazers. Let's go on to the... Board with a 24th pick and head to the Portland Trailblazers draft headquarters. Uh, this is the guy that I took um, in the locked on mock draft, Jacob Evans. Um, you know, we had a lot of good picks in this draft. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of NBA podcasters doing a draft, so everyone was trying to make very heady picks. Um, but, you know, I liked what Evans had, what Evans brings to the table. Uh, I like that he's got a nice wingspan at about six six nine. He's a little bit bigger than some of the other guards than uh, Akoji or Kyrie Thomas, and I think that the you know one of the things that you that you said, Chad, was that you know size on the wing is a major it, it is major. You know whether it's length or size, they need to be a little bit sturdier. You know around Damon CJ, and I think Evan, yeah, I think and I, I and I think Evans can bring that. Um, for for the Blazers, I think he could bring that, and he, he shot the ball pretty well, and you know he did some stuff offensively that shows you that hey, you know he can he can be a secondary playmaker, which is what the Blazers really need. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that of all these guys, Evans um, might not be the best at, at anything necessarily across the board from all of them, but I think he maybe checks the most boxes. So I think Evans would be a really interesting pick here. Like you said, he's a he's a really good defender. He's a really smart defender. 
Uh, he plays off the ball well, which is something I know we talked about last year with Mo Harkless um, getting lost in, on, on help defense sometimes. That never happens with Evans. He's a high IQ guy. He plays really well through screens too, which is a, another thing in today's NBA. You have to be able to defend the pick and roll. That's pretty much you know 90% of the offense teams are going to, and, and he plays really well through that. And then obviously he can he can shoot the three ball. He led his team in scoring. He only had 13 points a game this year, so it wasn't anything that jumps off the board at you, but – um, kind of the, the opposite of the uh, a Kogi thing with Georgia Tech. Evans is leading a very good Cincinnati team. They finished 31 and five last year. So, uh, and he, he was able to lead the team in scoring and, and did a lot of the intangibles that his team relied on him for. So, um, I think that's a guy that the Blazers should certainly have their eye on. Uh, another thing that's interesting is I saw the heard the Warriors were in love with him after a workout, and so thought that was interesting too. I mean, sometimes you. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You just got to uh, be able to, to follow other, you know, smart basketball minds. And I think the Warriors have nailed a ton of their draft picks from Draymond and Jordan Bell, even some of these end-of-bench guys they have. So if the Warriors are, are high on them, I think that's a great sign. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think Evans could be a good pick. What's, what's your thoughts on him? Yeah, no, I think it, and I think you know, I I know it, it it is a little bit of a cliche, and there are a lot of guys that come from so-so teams that really make an impact. But I do think that knowing how to win really matters, and I I, I really think that having that experience of being on a very good team in Cincinnati is a good thing. And I think the fact that he was like he learned how to lead on a good team and knows how to win, and I think. You know, those are things that you can't take for granted, I don't think, you know, because it's not a lot of guys, you know, just know how to do that. And, you know, having a lot of intangibles to bring to the table and being a smart player, again, you cannot coach uh, IQ. You know, you can't, or the basketball IQ, you just can't coach how to read the game, how to see the game and react in real time. And the fact that Evans, you know, has a good reputation for doing all those little things is... Yeah, uh, you know, really encouraging. Yeah, yeah, he he really brings a lot to the lot to the table. And then uh, on the defensive side, like I said, I mean, he's someone who you can you can throw out there on uh, on a on a top score on the other team and, and feel comfortable. Uh, when you're, he obviously didn't have the accolades like a guy like Kyrie Thomas had. But when you look a little bit deeper and like the advanced stats there, uh, that jumped out to me. Evans had three point one defensive win shares last year, which is impressive. Kyrie Thomas had one point six. So. Um, you start seeing how they, they impact the game, um, maybe in the things that don't show up in a box score. I know that's a cliche, but Evans, uh, he really brings it. So, I, I mean, mean that, yeah, he's I mean, on the board. Like, that's why we have advanced stats, you know? Like, that's why, that's, yeah. yeah. It, it's appealing. So, uh, he's a guy, he's a guy certainly that I would um, have my eye on at 24. I know there's some teams, uh, Utah's pretty high on him, uh, Minnesota's high on him, who are a little few picks ahead of us. So, uh, we'll see if he's on the board, but. Uh, a lot of a lot of wings out. There. Definitely a lot of wings out there. Well, Chad, uh, thanks for coming on with me to do the draft pod and help me with this Locked On Network mock draft. Listen to Locked On Blazers everywhere you can get your podcast. Where we cover the Blazers, we're going to be doing lots of draft stuff heading into the draft, and of course, we will have free agency coverage for you on Locked On Blazers. Just do what we think the Warriors might do. The strategy out of Portland, not a bad one, frankly, with all their success. There are some interesting names still on the board. Jerome Robinson, Boston College, L.A. L.A. Oka. Okobo out of France, Grayson Allen, Dante DiVincenzo, Mitchell Robinson, the unique center who played almost no college ball, uh, actually played none and bounced around and all these weird things. He hasn't been drafted. Kyrie Thomas, the two-time defensive player of the conference, has not been drafted. Did I mention uh, Mo Wagner has not been drafted? So lots of interesting names that are... Anthony Simmons, who possibly has some really big upside, didn't play high school, has not been drafted uh, as of yet. So interesting final six picks coming to you tomorrow with the Lakers, Philadelphia, Boston, Golden State, Brooklyn, and Atlanta. Before we wrap up today, let's get Jeremy Wu's take on the pick by the Portland Trailblazers in Jacob Evans and then head over to our analysts in Josh Lloyd and Jake Madison. Uh, is another guy who, you know, I think, you know, could go in the late first round. I think he's a solid player. I don't think he's a, a star. I don't think anyone's under that illusion. 
Uh, you know, offensively, he's not a guy who creates a ton of his own offense. You know, he did shoot the ball fairly well from three at Cincinnati, and you know, you're hoping he'll become sort of a three and D wing who you don't have to, you know, run plays for. We'll space the floor. We'll play defense. Uh, for me, you know, my question is, you know, he's not a very aggressive offensive player, and he's not really like a a true guy who really gets up in you defensively. You know, he he, he makes small plays, but I don't see him as a high end enough shooter or defender to be a surefire role guy. Uh, so I worry that he that he lacks, you know, a real calling card uh, skill. But if he's able to do a little bit enough of everything, you know, he might split the difference. And now we jump back over to Josh Lloyd, host of Monday's Locked on NBA, and Jake Madison, who hosts Wednesdays with John Corrales, here to get the final analysis of those last three picks we've seen in this mock draft. Chandler Hutchinson out of Chicago, Keita Bates Diop out of in, for Indiana, and Jacob Evans by Portland. Thanks, David. Let's uh, let's go back to these three picks that just went down. The Chicago Bulls with their second pick in the first round. This is courtesy of the Nikola Mirotic trade during the season. Chandler Hutchison of Boise State. We'd been hearing that he'd uh, received a first round promise, and that's why he had uh, didn't attend the, the combine. Obviously, in our scenario, that first round promise promise came from the Chicago Bulls. Hutchison is a an older player, but a guy that. If it all comes together, a high volume, efficient scoring, uh, wing player who can create for himself and for others, it's a perfect fit in Chicago and really in any team. And I think that the Bulls would be really, really happy to land him. Now, can he translate that from a Boise State team and their level of opponents to the NBA? That, of course, remains to be seen. But everything about him and the, and the skill set there is, is pretty appealing, I think. Yeah, this is a guy who averaged 20 points per game in college. He's pretty polished and just a scoring wing that should fit in right away. And when you think that they took Marvin Bagley the third earlier on in this draft, you've got guys that can step in, at least be in the rotation immediately. So now the Chicago team, if they look at the draft in our imaginary world here, not the draft, free agency, with money to spend, they might be able to get a fairly competitive team next year all of a sudden. Yeah, it is going to be interesting to see exactly how Hutchison translates. We've got the Indiana Pacers at 23, Kata Bates Diop from Ohio State. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not overly sold on, uh, on Bates Diop here. He is a, an older player, much like, uh, much like Hutchison. He's going to, he's 22 years of age already. Um, I, I don't know. I guess they do have a, a need in that front court in Indiana. It, it's a fine pick. I'm just not sure if there's much upside here. And there are other guys who I would rather have taken uh, ahead of Bates Diop at this at this spot. But it's not something that I can completely kill. No, like you could nitpick this one to death maybe, but it's a fairly safe pick. But this is a guy who can kind of defend one through four. He's got just enough shooting ability to make him at least be a credible threat. So, you know, what they're doing under head coach Nate McMillan, I think this kind of fits in a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's sort of what they're looking for, just for complementary type guys. And then we've got uh, the last pick of this group of uh, of, of players, and that's uh, the Portland Trailblazers at 24, selecting Jacob Evans out of Cincinnati, Cincinnati. Another older type wing player, but getting wing players who can be strong three-point shooters. Uh, that is always really useful, and this is a team that has had struggles on the wing with uh, Mo Harkless and, and Evan Turner, sometimes not being as uh, consistent as what they, what they need to be. And uh, as a strong defender, Evans could really fit into a rotation, maybe supplanting someone like a Pat Connaughton on this team, but he still is not. Uh, he's far from a um, from a can't miss prospect or a guy that's uh, you know, destined to uh, succeed. No, this is a rotation player, most certainly, but I actually really like this pick for Portland. They really needed a strong defensive perimeter player. They got that here in Jacob Evans. Cincinnati was one of the best defensives last season in college. He was uh, an integral part of that. His shot's not great, but they don't need that. You know, he doesn't have the ability to create his own shot, but they don't need that. This is a guy that you can just kind of throw out there it's situationally where you need him that'll get some time with the second unit. Overall, you know, I can't really complain that much about it at 24. So we head to the final day of our mock draft with a bunch of big names on the board. Josh Okoji out of Georgia Tech. I didn't even mention him. He's a big time player. So lots of guys on the board for the final six picks. It's all coming tomorrow. Reddit AMA today at 2 o'clock Eastern. Please join me and everyone else for that. It is the Locked On Podcast Network mock draft. Tomorrow we'll do the final six picks. This has been Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for tuning in to Locked On NBA. We hope you're enjoying the new five-day-a-week format of Locked On NBA, the place for you to get your 
quick, digestible look at what's happening in the NBA on a daily basis. Reminder to you that every single one of the NBA teams has a daily Locked On podcast as well. So go find your favorite team and subscribe to their Locked On podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, and all of your podcatchers. All part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Your company can advertise on the Locked On Podcast Network. And the first thing you'd get is a passionate, connected listener about a team they love. Now, the second part is all data. So here you go. You get an audience that's 98% male between the ages of 18 and 54 almost entirely. According to Edison Research, podcast listeners are 50% more likely to have a college degree and 30% of podcast listeners have a graduate degree. So you're reaching a more affluent, a better educated, and a connected audience for your company. We'd love to have you be a part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. You can email me, David Locke, at LockdownPodcast at gmail.com. Put your company in position to succeed by working with us, the Lockdown Podcast Network, the number one sports daily podcast network. Email me, David Locke, at LockdownPodcast at gmail.com.